We have our chair, Professor Bae Jae Ho from Yongin University, and we have our two discussants. I think um, I would like to introduce both of them from Liyum Museum, Lee Seung Hae, and from the Office of uh, Joge Order of Korean Buddhism, Shim Ju Wan. We have first. Seung Hae Lee, after receiving her doctorate in Korean and Chinese Buddhist arts history from the Department of Art History at the University of Chicago Graduate School, she worked as a full-time researcher at the Buddhist Academy of Dongle University and is currently a senior researcher at the Liu Museum of Art and is currently working on research and exhibition planning on East Asian Buddhist art focusing on Korea. And she has particular interest in Korean Buddhist statues, Bulbokjang, and Buddhist rituals, and has written many English academic papers. And next year, there is going to be a exhibition on East Asian Buddhist art focusing on the gender perspective, and she is currently working on next year's exhibition. She has recently worked on uh, a paper regarding the subject as well. And we have the next discussant, who is currently the administrator of the Cultural Department at the General Affairs Office of the Joge Order of Korean Buddhism. And in 2021, he received his doctorate in art history from Korea University, thesis study on iconography of the three Buddhist East Asia, and main research areas are the different Buddha statues. And recently, there was study on the wooden seated Buddha statue in Munsujan of Sangwansa, and he has been engaging in in-depth study of Buddha statues in Korea. I would like to ask our chair, Professor Bae Jae Ho, for his leadership in carrying out this roundtable and discussion. I should have actually worn a tie, but I just wore my glasses instead to make it more official to act as the chair for today's important roundtable and discussion. You heard the introduction of our discussions and we are going to have discussions regarding the presenters of today Han Jung Ho, Shin So Yeon and uh, the two uh, and Kim Kun Ja as Park Ah Yeon and we're going to hear discussions regarding session 3 Han Jung Ho, Shin So Yeon by Lee Seung Hae and then we're going to hear a response, and then we're going to hear the different discussions regarding Pagayon and Yugunja by Shim Juwan. And then, if we do have some time left, then we're going to receive questions from the floor. So that is how we're going to proceed. Let us begin. It is great to be here. As was introduced, I am Lee Seung Hae. Thank you very much for staying with us till the end of today's symposium. And thank you very much, all the presenters, for your enlightened presentations. And I have designated discussants. And I think Professor Han Jong-woo actually had prepared a very thorough presentation, but because of time constraints, there were very important areas that were missed out of the presentation. So the images of the different relics, if they can be seen during my discussion, I think it will be very helpful. And maybe we can ask for some visual support and I would like to actually read my uh, discussion. I have a shorter paper than the one in the booklet. So I would like to talk about the different ancient times that have been researched. And there were some gender perspectives that were discussed today. So it was a new approach. So it is very significant. and. Professor Han actually focused on the subject for a long time and overcame the limitations that there were not many. Uh, uh, 
different material and actually used glass uh, plated material and had in-depth research into these areas. So that is why I think today's presentation was actually uh, given. So I would like to ask a question focusing on two different areas. And Professor Han talked about the Shilla Buddhist history and talked about Ani, which has great significance, and as new material, there was the Sondosan rock car Buddha triad, and there were the epigraphs as well as the National Museum of Korea that owns the Baekji uh, Mukso Darani. And in the case of the Darani in ink on white paper or Baekji Mukso Darani, can you actually show us the work on the screen? Yes, that is a very important work. And now I think we can see the very important piece of work. And you talked about the early, mid, and the latter days. And for the mid and the latter days, I think there was not a lot of time. So it actually was not covered in your presentation. And my question is relevant to the, com the part. And Tarani is quite important because you can see in the middle there is the, uh, the the two figures, and then you can see the Tarani, the Buddhist text that are surrounding the two figures. And you can see there is the Sugodanani or Maha Pratisara that this is used often for. And he commented that this is the Usnisa Vijaya Dharani or the Purjan Jonsung Dharani. So for the Purjan Jonsung Dharani, it actually is uh, engraved in a lot of these types of the pillars. So this is a very important you know, uh, discovery. And in China and in Korea, uh, this was not actually depicted in the different Tarani so far. So my one of my question is that for this type of Tarani, uh, which is a visual representation and you can see that the combination with the Purjan Dunsung Tarani, where do you think uh, actually this comes from? So I would like to know your opinion on this. And another point I would like to make is about the Ani. On the left side, you can see the epigraph in ink, Chon A Ani. And here, you might think that it actually depicts the woman who is, looks like a nun or Piguni. So actually is this the originator or do you think the originator actually played a greater role and actually was the artist so i was curious about the role so that is my first question and my second question is in your last page you mentioned that in the latter page of uh, your presentation about the important artworks related to women in the latter part of uh, Shilla dynasty. There is the Chunwa Samnyo, the 833, Mokjo Birojana Bulsang. And I think because of time constraints, you were not able to mention it, which is the wooden Sakamuni Barista uh, or the statue. And I know that for you who has great knowledge in this subject, if you can give us your take on the wooden Varikona Buddha statue. I'd like to ask about Chin So your presentation on uh, the gendering of Bodhisattva uh, looks at the dual gender identity of Kwanim Bosar, the visual representation in art, and the gender role of Kwanim Bodhisattva, which is Avalokitesvara. As you, uh, she pointed out, if we only look at the gender perspective on the Kwanim Bosar, it only focuses on the femininity. So. This could be applied to all of the other researches that take a gender perspective on Kwanim Posar. However, if we take out the gender uh, view on uh, Kwanim Posar, in fact, Kwanim Posar is portrayed as male in the scriptures, but in art, uh, it is represented in female uh, representations. So this is a critical problem that might be uh, 
excluded. So this uh, important perspective is applied through this presentation, which is a meaningful attempt to approach to the entirety of the Korean medieval uh, Buddhist art history. Also, many of the discoveries of the consecrated objects and uh, her research into Buddha statutes have greatly contributed to Korea's research on Kwanse Umbo Sal. So I'm very honored to discuss on her presentation. I also have two uh, questions. First, you mentioned that the water moon uh, statue uh, is usually portrayed as a handsome male in uh, China, while the white robe quanim uh, is portrayed as a beautiful woman. So it shows a Chinese perception on the transformational bodies of Buddha or Bodhisattva. But in Korea, Korea, there is no clear dis gender distinction between the water moon quanim and the white robe quanim. Both are the transformational bodies of Kwan Seum Bosar. So I wonder uh, what they perceive the gender of the real essential body of Kwanim Bosar to be. And when looking, perhaps, were there any such discussions in old China or Korea? If so, could you please introduce them to us? And my second question is, as a bodhisattva of the Mahayana Buddhism, uh, Kwan Um transcends gender, but the expected, anticipated gender role to Kwan um, uh, reflects the gender perception of the society when the statues of Kwan um, Um was made. As you have mentioned, uh, in Korea, medieval uh, Buddha statues, relatively the feminization of Kwan Um is not very pronounced. So the Kwan Um with fish baskets or the Kwan Um with children of China, were they not known in Korea or were they simply not popular in Korea? Also, this is perhaps a bit out of the time frame you discussed today, but in late to Joseon, if we look at the Yangsan Shinungsa Daegwangcheon wall painting, Kwanum Sam Jondo, or the Amita Gungna Kwesangdo at Daegu Gumdang, it uh, explicitly portrays Kwanum uh, with fish basket. Therefore, Perhaps, how could you interpret the lack or absence of female representation of Kwanim in the medieval Korea Buddhist art history? Yes. <clears throat> Professor Han, well, let me answer your second question first. At He Insa, uh, there is the wooden very Okana Buddha, Mukjo Biro Jana Bursang, that I didn't actually think about. So I think. Um, a lot of the materials were related to the epigraphs and, well, for some, I tried to actually look into the uh, ones that could have some remains. And there is the Gumsong humor that I actually read most often because I have deep love for this uh, Buddhist history and artworks. So I think I missed that. So I will need to make up for that. And I read your discussion paper and I believe that uh, your comments are very important because I'm very much in, um, interested in 등신 and it seems that there are several meanings of 등신 by the historical society and by yourself. So I think we can actually think about the two meanings. So thank you very much for your comment and for the 달아니 well, there is something that I didn't show you during the presentation. So maybe this can actually be a visual answer to your question. When I'm bored, well, I look at the different uh, pictures, uh, the glass plated pictures, and I look at the different images. And I think Emu uh, Jung and uh, the material during the Japanese colonization are here at uh, are at the Muse National Museum of Korea. So I think that is very unique and special and the most precious resource. And you can see that in Gyeongju, in Namsan, there is the Sugu Dharani, the Mahapratisara Dharani. And I actually thought that this was the Sugu Dharani in the beginning for this Dharani, the Dharani in Inkan White Paper, the Baekji Mukso Dharani in the beginning, because 
it actually holds everything in the sugu darani, and you can see on either corner, you can see that there are the different uh, different dharma levels and the beads and the vajra, and you can see in the middle, there is a picture that is related to the uh, palwon or the record. And after doing some analysis, we saw that it was not sugu darani. And recently, I was looking through, through some material and I discovered that during last winter, I did some more analysis and I saw that it looks like a Maha Pratisara or Sugu Dharani in format. But you can see that for this, there is no color at all. So for even Chinese Dharani, they're mostly colored in. But you can see that it's just black and white and it doesn't look to be very dated. And here you can see that in different areas, there is the Dongrok, which is probably means that it probably was in a metallic container and it starts from here. This is where the beginning is. So you can see Namo, the beginning here, and looking at this sentence, after deciphering it and compare it in the Sutra, you can see it doesn't really match the Koryo Pan but you can see that it seems that it's the Purjon Junsung Dharani, which is the Usnisa Vijaya Dharani. And you can see that the format is very unique because it moves this way to right and then it goes to the top and then it encircles. So that is the direction of how we should read the text. Regarding the Dharani that we saw, Previously, it just moves in one direction, but you can see that it moves in all four directions and then ends here. Here, well, I couldn't really look at the real copy, but in the 8th century, there was this method that was used. So it seems to be similar to the Bujeon Junsung Dharani. And looking at the content, well, there were actually, in, uh, there was not a Bujeon Junsung Dharani that was similar to this. And, uh, well, I think regards to the use of Ani, it can go back in time. And I was not able to look at the all the materials. And I actually made some comparisons. And it seems that actually this is probably uh, uh, connected to the different relics during the ancient times. So this is not just for the women's commissioning, but also maybe unification Shilla times, maybe it can be dated till then. So it is very important as ancient text. And you can see that it looks, very, doesn't uh, the person look very pretty? And so I'm really sorry, Professor Han, but I think uh, time, constraints are, uh, are here and I actually gave the microphone to the discussant and not to Professor Han because I knew that he was going to explain. I actually want to really listen to the explanation but we don't have a lot of time left so maybe I can conclude. Well, I also believe that the woman could have been uh, some of the artists because you can see that the coloring or the depiction actually looked to be a little bit different from the ones of professional artists. So I'm sorry, I had to cut you off. Thank you. Then I will uh, respond to the questions. Thank you for your question. Regarding your first question, the water moon uh, uh, is compared to a handsome man and white robed is compared to a beautiful woman in China. Well, this is more about the transformational body of Kwan Um. It is more about the outwardly appearance. In fact, com there are no, not much discussion in China about the real essential body of Kwan Um because Avalokitesvara himself is viewed as the. Uh, sometimes viewed as transformational body of Buddha. So like in movies, we see dreaming inside a dream. Uh, they probably don't go in as deep as to discuss the transformational, uh, the essential body of the essential body. So 
in Western uh, side, sometimes the term goddess is used to describe Kwanim, uh, which was very controversial like 20 years ago. And many scholars felt against such use of terminology because Kwanim itself is not feminine. Sometimes Kwanim uh, is transformed into uh, female bodies, but it, they don't view the essence of Kwanim as female. So that was why the term goddess was so controversial. Well, discussing the real identity of the real essential body of Kwanim is still elusive. And well, transformational body or apparition are talked about. And there has not been an explicit discussion on that topic in Korea either. So it was difficult to um, come across any material on that topic. And I know I have to make it uh, short. But the apparition of uh, Kwanim often appears in Buddhism. But sometimes, perhaps in a very uh, vulgar manner, um, Korea, uh, it talks of the female body. So it has a condescending nuance uh, on women. If you look back at many anecdotes in Buddhism, so well looking, well discussing about the gender of the real body of Kwanim was probably difficult in a patriarchal society, but a rather equal approach to gender equal approach to the apparition of Buddha was attempted. Well, whether Kwanim with fish basket and Kwanim with children were known in Korea, I think because there are some uh, block paintings of such in Korea, they are not titled as Oram Kwanim, Kwanim with basket or but there are iconography in the print uh, paintings uh, it illustrates Kwanim with children so probably in Joseon dynasty and Goryeo dynasty uh, Koreans were aware of the iconography of uh, Avalokitesvara with children but we were within the religious framework that was uh, based on the custom of China so if the customs did not transfer to Korea, probably the iconography didn't explicitly uh, transfer into Korea. Also, the customs probably differed from region to region. And in Joseon era, the society becomes Confucianist. So probably we don't know if there was active interaction in the uh, civil level. So a little after Joseon uh, dynasty, probably such a prince, uh, prince probably was able to enter Korea uh, by 19th century. Well, uh, do you have any comments, Singhae Lee, for uh, Dr. Lee to these uh, responses? Thank you very much for answering the question. And I would like to invite uh, Shim Ju Wan for the discussion as well. I am Shim Ju Wan and working for the Jogejong Order. And I would like to deliver my discussion for session four. And I would first like to give a discussion on the presentation of Park Ayeon. The presentation was about Buddhist art of the Lady Myung Bing Kim, woman from the Joseon royal family. I believe that the reason presenter represent, presented this topic was because she brought a fresh wind to the academic world by presenting a paper studying the Buddha statues within the five-story stone pagoda of Sujongsa Temple and the Buddha statues of Bungma, Bungamsa Temple in Munggyeong from the perspective of royal origins. The presentation focuses on Myungbin Kim, a concubine chosen by King Taejong, who had a high status among royal women in the 15th century and was a part of the inner court for the longest period of time and examined the Buddhist sutras and Buddhist statues created under the patronage of Myungbin Kim. According to the presentation, Lady Myungbin Kim was the originator of four volumes of sutras, including two types of the Bumu Unjunggyong and one Jabi Doryang Champop, as well as Hukseok Temple seated 
Amitabha Buddha and Sujong Temple Shakyamuni Buddha statue from the second half of the 15th century. Through this presentation, it was revealed that Myeongbin Kim was a 15th century Buddhist believer and a person who had a great influence on the, as a supporter of Buddhist art. This presentation is not only research outcome in line with the main topic of art and gender, but is also expected to contribute to the history of Buddhism in the early Joseon dynasty and the history of the Buddhist art in the future. It was very helpful for my studies as well, and I learned many things. I hope that this, my discussion will contribute to the research results of the presentation. And even if it's insufficient, I would like to ask um, some questions. Although there, my, I have only one question, there are many linked questions to it, so it can make the question a bit complicated, and I would like to ask for your kind understanding. The question is about the gilt bronze Shakyamuni Buddha statue discovered at the Sujongsa Temple Stone Pagoda with an inscription engraved on it commissioned by Myeongbin Kim. The prayer inscription found, or the Bogomun in the Bokjang of this Buddha statue, in date, indicates that the three concubines of King uh, Sungjong commissioned it in 1493, and it is believed that the five five-story stone pagoda of Sujongsa Temple was built in 1493. So if so, it, is it possible? It is possible, is it? The five-story stone pagoda was built in 1493. I'm curious about your opinion. According to the paper, it was determined that the inscription engraved on the lower silver plate of the gilt bronze Shakyamuni Buddha statue was engraved before in 1479 when Myeongbingi was still alive, not in 1493 when the inscription was enshrined. Therefore, the lower limit for the construction period of the gilt bronze seated Buddha statue is 1479 and I completely agree with this view. If so, I'm curious about the presenter's opinion on when, when the gilt bronze seated Buddha statue was created. Considering that 1411 was the year when Myeongbin Kim was appointed, Myeongbin Kim lived in the royal family for at least 68 years. So the period of construction of the Buddha statue has no choice but to spend a rather long period of time from 1411 to 1479. In existing research, the chronological age of the gilt bronze seated Buddha statue was from 1459, the year of the founding of Sujongsa Temple, to 1493, the year of creating of the Buddhist Bokjang records. Although the lower limit of the chronological age was narrow through the presenter's research, the upper limit was wide, and according to the year of birth and death of Myeongbin Kim, ranging from at least 1411 to 1479. So I'm curious about the presenter's opinion. If so, I also have some questions about how to date the crea creation of the gilt bronze Buddha statues and other Buddha statues enshrined together. Is the portable shrine of the gilt bronze Buddha the shrine whether the gilt bronze Sakamuri Buddha statue was enshrined? Is the gilt bronze seated Avakis Kitesvara Bodhisattva statue that was rebuilt together a companion piece of the Sakamuni Buddha statue? Is the Sakamuni Buddha statue and Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva and Kitsgarbha Bodhisattva statues found in the gilt bronze statue shrine a set? So I have many questions, such as whether the Buddha Triad statue and portable shrine of gilt bronze Buddha were commissioned by Lady Myeongbin Che. These may be very complicated and may be on, uh, questions born out of my uh, on knowledge. So I hope for your kind understanding. And next, for Yu Gunja's presentation. Uh, she has presented on the role and characteristics of royal female patrons in the creation of Buddhist statues during the reign of King Sukjong. Uh, she probably decided on this topic because she has uh, published an influential paper on research on royal sponsored Buddha statues in Joseon Dynasty. Also, uh, she has uh, published a great amount of records on the enshrined objects. Uh, in 2017 in a book named uh, Joseon Dynasty uh, enshrined objects of Buddha statues. I think they were influential um, researches on uh, Korea's uh, Buddhist art history. So I think she is probably one of the most authoritative um, scholars in Korea. So I'm very honored. Her uh, research results uh, were in line with the uh, overall theme, uh, art and gender, and I hope that my discussion will contribute uh, to her amazing work. Um, through 17th and 18th century, the role of uh, royal women during King Sukjong's time is elucidated. Uh, she looks at the transitional politics and uh, the royal women and the 
implications of the patrons of the Buddha statues that were created during this time. 17th century is the period when the most amount of Buddha statues were uh, created in Korea's history. Due to the Seven Year War after Japanese invasion, many temples of Korea were demolished. So, uh, in order to uh, recover, many Buddhist statues had to be built. Uh, the restoration was completed to a certain extent uh, in late 17th century to 18th century. So, what happened here was that rather than new construction of Buddhist statues, there was a lot of maintenance and coloring work of the existing Buddha statutes. The 3H7 uh, Buddha statue at Gakwangjeon Hwa Omsa was the biggest uh, less Buddhist uh, project in uh, uh, Joseon dynasty and the it is the biggest scale Buddhist uh, Buddha statue and of the Joseon dynasty and this uh, research looks into the royal women who were involved in that very project. Not only the records on the enshrined objects, but many other literature are comparatively analyzed to uncover the political background of this uh, Buddhist uh, presentation, which was especially um, of great interest to me, who is uh, studying Three Age Buddha statute. Uh, so I have, I am very grateful for her research, and I have two questions. First question is about Suk Bin Choi, who was the one who led the uh, statue of Kak Kwang Chum. And uh, you argue that the biggest intention was to pray for the soul of In Hyam to reach the pure land. And uh, you uncover that Suk Bin Choi was a political partner of Queen In Hyam. Uh, Ahead of the construction of Kak Kwang Jeon in 1702, Queen In Hyun passed away, and when the statue was built in 1703, Suk Bin Choi prayed for her soul to reach the Pure Land. Then I wonder if all everyone who was involved in the Kak Kwang Jeon Buddha statue project were a West people, uh, because Se Peng Yun who wrote the offering text and Yi Jin Hyu who wrote the uh, signpost were in fact South people. This is when Neo-Confucianism really took off and persecution on Buddhism was widespread. So I wonder if such many people from the royal uh, family were able to participate in a Buddhist project. Yeon Ingun, Suk Bin Cho, Yong Bin Kim are one of the royals. So this was especially noteworthy. Second question is that, uh, in fact, the royal women created various Buddha statues, including the three Buddha, seven deity uh, Buddha statue, and the Uljin Bul Yongsa Myeongbujeon, uh, Ten King statue, Bongwansa Myeongbujeon, uh, Jijang Shi Wangsang, and the Oksudong Mitasa Amita Buddha statue. I wonder if they had a cl clear preference on iconography or if they were just merely simply uh, patroning for uh, the Buddhist projects. Thank you. And uh, Park Ayeon, please. Thank you very much for your question. And regarding the Sujongsa Buddhist statue, you asked several questions. And regarding your first question, is about when the stone pagoda was created. And regarding the construction period of the stone pagoda, it has been estimated to be between 1459 when the temple was rebuilt by King Sejo and to 1493 when the Buddha statue was enshrined in the stone pagoda and I agree with your opinion that it was uh, the concubines of King uh, Song Jong enshrined the Buddha statue that the Lady Myung Bin Kim revered personally when the stone pagoda was built in 1493. Even if the stone pagoda was built before then, it is highly likely that it was after 1459. And I think that it's unlikely that the stone pagoda was dismantled to enshrine the Buddha statue in 1493, which does not have much of a time gap. In addition, it is said that when the stone pagoda was dismantled in 1970, there was an ink record written, a record of Hong Chi six years on the inside of the circular device hole of the roof stone on the second and third floor. So if this is a record from the time the stone pagoda was established, it is highly likely that it was built in 1493. The second is about uh, the second uh, statue in question. And as I uh, 
explained, there is the 정상계주 on the head of the Buddha statue, the square body composition and the expression of nipples on the chest are characteristics of Ming Dynasty Tibetan style, which mainly appeared in Buddha statues of the Joseon Dynasty after the mid-15th century. Examples include, include the gilt bronze seated Buddha statue excavated from Chigyeongdong Najin and the gilt bronze seated Amita Buddha statue excavated from the Unjong Valley in Kumgangsan Mountain in 1451. Therefore, if we narrow down the construction period of the Sujongsa Temple Buddha statue, it is presumed that it was constructed after the 1450s but before 1479 when Myeongbin Kim passed away. Also, you asked some questions about the Gumdong Bulgam, the portable shrine of the Gilbron Buddha Triad, and the two Bodhisattva statues discovered together with the Shakyamuni Buddha statue in the stone pagoda of Sujongsan Temple. And they're all related questions, so I will answer all of them at once. In the portable shrine gilt bronze Buddha triad, in addition to the gilt bronze seated Buddha Shakyamuni Buddha, there are also the gilt bronze seated Kiskarba Bodhisattva statue and the gilt bronze pensive Bodhisattva statue. And I actually didn't ex have enough time to explain but I believe that the three gilt bronze Buddha statues discovered inside the portable shrine of gilt bronze Buddha triad were not composed of a triad or trio from the beginning, but it is thought that the Shakyamuni Buddha statue was first enshrined in the Buddhist temple as a solitary Buddha, and later the two other statues were enshrined. And there are three reasons for uh, this, several reasons for this. First, the expression techniques and sizes of the three sections, three statues are very different, so it is difficult to believe they were created together. Second, the main Buddha statue of Buddha and two Bodhisattva statues do not fit the standard form of the Buddha triad. Thirdly, when the interior of the portable shrine houses the two Bodhisattva statues on the left and right with the Buddha statue at the center, there is no free space. If it were a portable shrine to enshrine the three together from the beginning, it would have been needed and had some internal space. Therefore, it is thought that Yongbin Kim commissioned a gilt bronze seated Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha statue and enshrined it in the portable shrine to worship it as the original Buddha. And later in the remaining interior space, King Sungjong's concubines placed the gilt bronze seated pensive Bodhisattva Buddha and gilt bronze seated kissed Garba Bodhisattva together. And as an additional opinion about the repaired Avalo Kitesvara Bodhisattva, it is recorded in the Bukjang that Shakyamuni Buddha and Avakislav uh, Vara Bodhisattva were repaired or renovated, which shows that not only the Shakyamuni Buddha statue, but also the Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva were repaired and enshrined in the pagoda. However, I believe that the renovated Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva is not the gilt bronze pensive Bodhisattva Buddha, but a wooden Avalokitesvara Bodhisattva found among the wooden triads found on the first pagoda-based body stone, along with the gilt bronze triad Buddha statue. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so thank you for your questions, Mr. Shim. Uh, you had two questions. First is whether all of the people who were involved in the uh, production of Buddha statue at Kakwangjan were uh, a part of the West people faction or the South people faction and whether it was possible for uh, so many royals to be involved in a Buddhist pro project in a Confucian society. Well, to start with the latter part, usually people don't are against the expression yu, which means persecution of Buddhism to elevate uh, Confucianism during Joseon Dynasty, and when it comes to the political affiliation, you are well aware uh, that of the Injo Pangjeon, after which all queens were agreed to be uh, selected from the West people families. But the one who went against that rule was Hibin Chang uh, during the Kisa transition. So apart from Hibin Chang, all other queens were from the West people family. Therefore, the royal women were mostly from the West people faction. But what about South people? Abdication of Queen Inhyeon was opposed by some South people 
while other South people actively uh, pushed abdication. But Kim Jin, uh, Yu, Yi Jin Hyu, and Cha Peng Yun were not uh, the supporters of abdication of Queen In Hyu, and they had close relationships with monks. So, uh, monk Kepa Song Neung, after the project at Ga Kwang Jeon, uh, she, when she he, he started working on a different uh, project, he actually seeked uh, Cha Peng Yu to write a signpost for that project. So. Regardless of the political affiliation, they still had close ties with the monks like Song Neung. And I did not include the Buddhism policies of Suk Jong due to time constraint, but he was worried that Kyung Jong would take over the throne. Before he died, he met a high ranking official, which was very unprecedented. And he uh, entrusts uh, the duty to care for his son, Yongju. So this is an object for future paper, but Sukbin Choi and Yeoningun, who later on becomes Yongju, was involved in the Buddhist project in Gakwangjeon to pray for the soul of Queen Inhyun and those who were uh, related to the abdic and this is because they uh, needed the empowerment of West people. Also, when celebrating Bukhan Sansong, uh, Suk Jong needed the help of uh, monks. So he appointed Kepa Song Neung as the head monk to proceed with that project. So this provides some more background. And the second question about whether a specific iconography was preferred by the royal people is, well, the Myeongbujeon Jongsan and Amita Buddha were very popular because they were related to the theme of leading souls to the Pure Land. But in the case of Hwaomsa, after Daksangshik, for three days, the Waterland Festival was held and it prayed for the well-being of the royal and everyone who was uh, patroning this project. So rather than preference for iconography, they went for uh, projects that were aligned with the needs of the times. Thank you. Well, do you have any follow-up comments? <laughs> Well, uh, the questions were very simple, but uh, the answer was very in-depth and insightful, and it resolved all of my questions. Thank you. Well, since we have participants online, uh, are there any participants from the U.S. still awake? to join this conference? If not, then why don't we open up the mic to the floor? If you have any questions, please note who your question is directed to and who you yourself are. <laughs> uh, so please ask your questions. Oh. Thank you for the opportunity. I am from Seoul National University, and writing my uh, and I wrote my masters in the Buddhist art, and I am working at the Hansung Baekje Museum. And I have a question to Park Ayeon, and thank you very much for your presentation. And in your presentation, I recognize that. Before 1479, the statue was established, and it was enshrined in uh, 1493, I believe. So then f there, there's a 14-year time gap. So what was the enshrinement situation, and how was it maintained or managed? Do you have any ideas? I would like to know what your thoughts are, and my second question is, for this type of smaller statue, Buddha statue, well, Myeongbin Kim was a very influential person at the time, and 
Were, were there cases when smaller Buddha statues were worshipped by such influential people during that time as their main Buddha statue? Thank you very much for your questions. And it seems that from 1479, when Myeongbin Kim passed away, and uh, before and and there was a period until 1493, and you asked about what do you think happened to the statue during that time before the enshrinement, and Myeongbin Kim, I believe, uh, revered it as the main Buddha statue, and then probably was in the court in the royal court, and then the concubines actually renovated or repaired it and enshrined it in the uh, pagoda, which is what I think. And regarding some examples uh, of the smaller Buddhist statues as their main Buddha statue, it is in the Joseon Wangjo uh, Shilok, but I think we only have this as the remaining statue in question. I hope that answered your question. Thank you.